Good morning and welcome to a magnificent Monday. We are here for our weekly read aloud. And as you can see, I am not in my office. I am at the Sherman Phoenix today. More importantly, I am here at Funky Fresh. And if you have not had Funky Fresh spring rolls, listen, you are missing a treat. And so I'm so excited to be here today. A lot of cooking goes on here at Funky Fresh. And so today, we are going to be learning about George Crumb. And the name of the book is called George Crumb and the Saratoga Chip. Today, we are going to be learning about this famous African-American who actually invented the potato chip. And so, before we get started, I want to give a special, special shout out to Mr. Truman McGee, who has invited us here into our kitchen, and he has a special treat for us a little later. And looking over here at these potatoes might give you a little bit of a hint. And so, getting us ready, here we go. George Crumb and the Saratoga Chip. George stood before the students in a one-room classroom. His palms were sweaty and his knees were weak. All the first graders could count to 100 except George. His sister Kate sat across the room with the older students. Kate helped George practice his numbers at home every night and was always encouraging him. He looked at Kate, took a deep breath, and started to count. George counted up to 68 and then got confused and couldn't remember which number came next. The other children laughed, and George felt his skin begin to prickle. It was difficult for George and Kate growing up in the, 19, in the 1830s. They were part Native American and part African American, at a time when people of color in the United States were often treated as inferior to white people. George had a feisty streak and he would get frustrated when the other children laughed at him or acted as if they were better than him. He wanted them to know he was just as good as they were. When George was with Kate, his feistiness turned playful and mischievous. He joked with his sister, he teased her. He taught Kate to climb a tree and shoot a bow and arrow better than any boy in the county. he finished his schooling, George began fishing and hunting full time. He made a living by selling fresh fish and wild game to nearby restaurants. One day, George met a fisherman hunting in the mountains. The Frenchman was an excellent cook. He taught George how to prepare his fresh fish and game over the open flames of an outdoor fire. George quickly discovered he had a passion for cooking. He experimented with different spices and cooking techniques, a pinch of salt here, some extra heat there, until each recipe was just right. Soon, George had perfected many delicious meals, freshly roasted game birds, poached fish, grilled venison, and more. George wanted to show all of Saratoga Springs what a good cook he was. He decided the best way to do this was to become a chef in a restaurant. It wasn't easy for George to get a job as a chef in those days. Most restaurant owners wouldn't hire a man of color to be anything but a waiter. George didn't let that stop him. Sure enough, George's excellent cooking skills shone through. He landed a job at Moon's Lake House, one of the best restaurants in Tar Saratoga Springs. George's heart swelled when he thought about all the people who would now enjoy George quickly became famous for his wild game and fish dishes. Prominent people, including Cornelius Vanderbilt, one of the richest men in America, traveled great distances to eat it. George's most sought after dish was his canvas bag duck. It was so tender and juicy that no other chef in the area could match its taste. George enjoyed creating new recipes at Moon's Lake House, but he soon realized he had little patience for the fussy customers. They demanded immediate attention to their needs and were quick to complain. They acted as if they were better than the people serving them, something George did not like in the least. Luckily, Kate worked as a waitress at the restaurant. 
She tried her best to keep George in good spirits and his feistiness from getting the better of him. One evening, a customer complained to Kate that his meal was not hot enough. Kate apologized and picked up the man's plate and headed swiftly toward the kitchen. George knew the meal he had sent out had been perfectly prepared, but he also knew he had to please the restaurant's customer. So he carefully spread the tender quail and vegetables into a small cast iron skillet over hot flames. After a few minutes, George tested the temperature of the food and decided it was just right. With great care, he scooped everything onto a fresh plate and placed it on a silver platter. George wiped the sweat from his brow, straightened his starch white chef's apron, and stepped out into the dining room. Proud of his efforts, George placed the hot meal in front of the customer. The man took a small bite, then announced that the food was still not hot enough. George's skin prickled. He tried to hide his annoyance and gave the man a weak smile. Without a word, George took the plate and quickly turned. All of a sudden, he lost his balance and shook. A ripple of laughter passed through the dining room when George hit the floor. His cheeks grew hot and flushed. As George brushed, him, brushed himself off, he heard a woman whisper loudly about the poor quality of the staff. George felt just like he was back in first grade, trying to count to 100. He headed to the safety of the kitchen, hoping the night would soon be over. George continued to have good days and bad days when the customer's at Moon's Lake House. He still loved cooking, but his patience for pleasing difficult customers was growing thin. Then one hot summer day in August, 1853, something happened that changed George's life forever. It was lunchtime and Moon's Lake House was packed. A woman ordered French fried potatoes, a relatively new and fashionable item at the time. Some chefs would have shied away from making something new when the restaurant was so busy, but George was sure his friend, the French woodsman, had taught him how to make perfect French fries. So George cooked up a piping hot batch and sent them out to the customer. The woman looked at the plate of french fries and before even taking a bite, complained to the waiter that the potatoes were cut too thick. The waiter knew not to argue with a customer, so he graciously took the french fries back to the kitchen. George was shocked to see the potatoes return. He had just about had enough of fussy customers. George grabbed the potato, started slicing. Kate saw a spark of feistiness in her brother's eyes that she hadn't quite seen in a while. George was very, very careful to cut the potatoes very, very thin. They were so thin that when he held the slice up to the light, he could see straight through it. Then he put the slices into a pot full of hot oil. He purposely cooked the potatoes longer and at a higher temperature than was needed for the perfect french fries. When the potatoes were crisp and brown, George removed them from the oil and piled them onto a plate. He decided to serve his special new creation to the customer himself. Kate and other members of the staff peered anxiously through the kitchen doors. Their eyes were glued to the woman. No one wanted to miss her reaction. George presented the plate of French fries and waited for the woman's complaints. She took a small bite, then another, and another. Finally, she declared them the most delicious potato delicacy she had ever tasted. George was so stunned, he didn't know what to say. He mumbled his things and returned to the kitchen in a day.
Baby Moon's Lake House, George bought some land and built a restaurant that he named Crumb's Place. On the surrounding farmland, he raised chickens, cows, and pigs, and grew vegetables and fruit. All the food served in the restaurant came fresh from the farm, including the potatoes from George's famous chips. George was proud of his restaurant. It was nestled among tall shade trees and had an inviting front porch facing a lake. It was a comfortable place where diners could enjoy good food, fun, and laughter. There were always long lines at Crumb's Place and customers had to wait their turns for seats in the dining room. So George devised a plan that made him very happy indeed. Rich or poor, light-skinned or dark-skinned, young or old, female or male, everybody had to wait just the same because everyone was equal at Crumb's Place. And if any customers happened to fuss about waiting their turn, Good old George would get a feisty look in his eyes and say, if you can't wait, get your grub at Moons. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us for today's Read Aloud, George Crum and the Saratoga Chip. Just us and books.